starting in 10, 9, 8. Welcome, cyborgs, lasagna, and organic components to the 207th episode of an Unearthly Podcast, streaming live on the 17th of May, 2017, and featuring Oxygen, written by Jamie Matheson, starring Peter Capelli as the Doctor, Pearl Mackey as Bill Potts, and Matt Lucas as Nardole, finally along with us on a proper adventure. I am Bill Sylvia, the Man in Black, and with me are Mad Matt Winchell. Hello. I have Randy the USA. Ron oh. Randy Ronson McCulloch. Always a pleasure. Aaron Romeo Moon Burke. Uh, my neighbor Totoro in theaters again. Tim the Enchanter Sheridan. Hello. And Thomas Fireheart Kennedy. Hey. All right. So tonight on the podcast, we have, of course, the news. Followed by a little more discussion Bill wants to do on Guardians of the Galaxy 2 because he didn't get to see it when we talked about it last week. Yep. And it's then finally, on this one. our review on uh, the episode. Uh, just a little warning. Um, although it's dying down here, there is a severe thunderstorm in the state right now that is about to hit Matt at any minute. So. Oh, it's been it's been brewing in the background already for like the last ten minutes. It's a nasty one. It's been very rumbly, yes. I'm going to crack the door because I don't want to faint from heat exhaustion. <laughs> don't well, mean 90 the window? Down there. Is it 90 out there, too? No, we're in one of these humidity roll situations mm. where, you know, it rains and then the humidity just builds and builds and builds and builds and builds until it finally erupts in rain again. And it's been hitting the upper 70s. Which is I wanna, freaking I know weird we for went, May. I want to know how we went from 60 to 90. Pretty <laughs> sure it was 40 earlier in the week. Yeah, we went from 30s, lower 30s, all the way up to like 85. 80. Yeah, so you're getting hit by the same thing, mm -hmm. only warmer. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to crack the window open. You crack that window. Meanwhile, Rand can take us off with the birthdays. All right. So, in birthdays, the first thing we have is on the 12th of May, we celebrate the birthday of Catherine Tate, who everybody should remember as Donna Noble from Series 4, who turned 49. Uh, Catherine's been touring of late with her live stage version of the Catherine Tate show, as well as doing voice work as Donna Noble in the Big Finish 10th Doctor Adventures. Uh, if you remember, I think we did the, uh, the first volume of that uh, earlier this year, or was it last that year? we did. Or earlier, earlier year, one of I these believe. years. Yeah. <laughs> Some year, every year. So, happy birthday, Catherine. Moving forward to the 13th of May, uh, we celebrate the birthday of Frances Barber, played Madame Kavorian in Series 6, who turned 59. We haven't seen much of her lately, but I have it on good authority she'll be in the upcoming film, or in the upcoming film, Film Stars Don't Die in Liverpool, later this year. I have no idea what it's about. I just heard that's where she's going to be in. And then, um, also on that same day, uh, we celebrate the birthday of Zoe Wanamaker, uh, who played Lady Cassandra Dot Delta Seventeen in uh, series one and series two, and she turned sixty-eight. 
Zoe's been on stage most of the last year, appearing in the world premiere production of Elegy. So happy birthday, Catherine, Francis, and Zoe. Best to you. And that's all I have for birthdays. Oh, okay, well, now we get to the Saturday news. Uh, Jeffrey uh, Belden. Belden? Uh, has passed away at the age of 93. Uh, he's best known for his portrayal as Cat Weasel, the eccentric 11th century wizard who was the star of the LWT children's series produced in the early 1970s. And then also as uh, as well as playing the Crow Man in the John Pertwee series Warzel Gummidge. Considering how popular Warzel Gummidge is, I'm surprised that's not what he's known best for. Yeah, he was considered to uh, he he was considered for the role of the Doctor twice uh, when the first when the series first came out, and then also, uh, gosh, when Hartnell left the role in 1966. So let me see here. He was he had to have been another series here. He played or Organon, the astrologer, and the Tom Baker story, the creature from the pit. That would have been near the end of Tom Baker's run. That was with Romana too. Oh, okay. It was that, I think it was that either that was during that time they had the randomizer or just after they broke the randomizer. Hmm. So it's, it's, be, it's between um, Key to Time and E-Space, somewhere in there. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. So, and I mean, he's 93, so that's a good run. So he must have been 40 mm. when they first offered him to play the Doctor. Yeah, he's been in many, many other things. But do you want, do you want to finish that last Doctor Who bit? All right. Uh, he would eventually voice the Doctor in Big Finish, uh, the Doctor Who Unbound Stories, Old Mortality, and A Storm of Angels. Those are the alternate universe where something changed with the Doctor. Yep. Hmm. Um, we normally see people like David Warner voicing the Doctor in those, but there's a few of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, he's been in uh, Prince Caspian, The Voyage of the John Treader, All Creatures Great and Small. Casualty, of course. Yeah, he's he's he was a big actor. I mean... No, he was in Walking the Dead, not The Walking Dead. No, that was Waking the Dead. Oh, Waking the Dead. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, I did I'm the just same thing you did, and I read it again. on leashes and taking them out for a walk. <laughs> yeah, if he was in The Walking Dead by his age, he was probably playing a zombie. Oh, so the movie Fido, then. I was going to say. <laughs> All right. Um, let's go ahead and move on to our episode news. And that would be me. And just first is the overnight figures for Oxygen. Uh, this is brought to us from uh, our normal source at DoctorWhoNews.net, uh, who report that Oxygen uh, had an overnight viewing audience of 3.57 million viewers, which was 20% 20 20, 20 of the total television audience. This is Britain television audience, according to unofficial figures. Uh, BBC One had three of the top four spots for the day, the last being Oxygen, uh, which is headed off by Pointless Celebrities, Eurovision Song Contest. Uh, that's only two things. So I... It had three of the top four spots. So. Oh, three of the top four spots. So okay. number one, Pointless Celebrities. Yep. Number two, Eurovision Song. Yeah, num number three, I feel like X, that was kind of a strange ITV. way to Number four, that. Oxygen. Uh, ITV did take the top with Britain's Got Talent. Okay, so correction. Number one, ITV's Britain's Got yep. Talent. Number two, Pointless Celebrities. Mm -hmm. And number three, Eurovision Song Contest. Or, excuse me, reverse that. Britain's Got Talent, Eurovision Song Contest, Pointless Celebrities. I was going to say, the Eurovision con Song Contest usually kicks about everything's ass. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like Eurovision slipped this year. Well, it, it's it's not beating out Britain's Got Talent. 
which is again freaking huge ass celebrity, you know, reality TV con uh, contest. So it's are you going to go with con song contest A or song contest B? More pointless celebrities. Which it had a Doctor Who related round apparently. Oh. All right, um, moving on to our next piece, um, some of the press reaction to Oxygen. Uh, the Telegraph uh, says that it was uh, 2001 meets Alien uh, and that it was suitably scary. The Mirror calls it a claustrophobic treat. I think this might be the first time that the Mirror didn't uh, play the negative Nancy. Yep. Uh, can look for quotes that stand out. Um. Hmm. Den of Geek mentioned that there has not been a duffer this episode and that this is as good a standalone episode as we've had this season. Uh, Ars Technica gives it a B minus. Um. AV Club says that uh, the story bit off more than it can chew and should probably have been a two parter. I'm not sure I agree with that. Um, IGN mentions that the episode is not one of season 10's strongest outings. Uh, there's a lot of busy work involved. Um, and then Doctor Who Watch mentions that this uh, they thought this episode let Capaldi shine in a way that we haven't seen before in one of his most human moments doing something for one of the most human consequences. All right. Uh, moving on to the Australian overnights. Uh, we had 437,000 viewers in the five major capital cities. It was the second highest rated ABC drama of the day and the 13th highest rated program of the day overall. Uh, as usual with overnights, this does not include iView, regional, time shifted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, if we uh, look uh, back last week to thin sorry, the week before last to Thin Ice, uh, the consolidated numbers for that are in, uh, including Time Shifted, which was 553 viewers in the five major capital cities. You mean 553,000, right? Sorry, 553,000 uh, viewers in the five major capital cities. I was going to say, that's the <laughs> ultimate low ratings for Doctor Who ever. Uh, it had 83,000 additional viewers uh, from Time Shifting, which made it the fifth highest Time Shifted program of the day, uh, which was fairly close to others. The highest Time Shifted program of the day had 94,000. And the 11th highest rated program of the day overall once again, not including iView or regional viewers. And our final bit on Oxygen is the audience appreciation figure of 83, which, as we've discussed several times, is pretty much bog standard Doctor Who at this point. You can pretty much assume that an episode has 83 plus or minus one or less, unless it's really great or really terrible. Mm-hmm. And really, if you think about it, 83 usually comes out to about a 4 on our scale-ish. I'm starting to think that the, the non-sci-fi people involved in the AI just type in 83 whenever Doctor Who comes up, unless they've already heard that it was a great or a shit episode. I don't know. I really don't know how the AI people really do it. Anyway, so we go from the present episode to the past... And the final ratings are in from the Barb for Knock Knock. Um, let's see. This is uh, including HD plus one, etc. Um, it got an official rating of 5.73 million viewers. Uh, that makes it the 21st most watched program for the week and the seventh most watched on BBC One. Um, as we kind of mentioned, I think last week, ITV tends to skew towards the very top of the, uh, the tableau once you've added all the people that are watching Time Shifted, etc. Uh, taking up the first seven spots with mostly Coronation Street. And of course, Britain's Got Talent, which we just mentioned. 
Um, and then, of course, it has to go through all the East Enders and Emmerdale episodes. But even there, it's losing to Antiques Roadshow and the Durrells. Um, so, uh, which are knocking it out of the top 20. It is, however, beating out Grandchester, uh, the ITV detective series, but just barely. All right. So, uh, from previous, we're going to uh, future episodes, and we have the new publicity images up for uh, Saturday's episode, Extremis. Um, as we can see, uh, and if you've seen the trailer for it, uh, the doctor is now once again sporting his sunglasses, but we know it's for a completely different reason this time. Mm-hmm. Um, it also looks like they're in that library from the trailer. Yep. I can't tell if they're using a, a rerun of that publicity image for this, but yeah, we do know the fact that uh, part of the uh, um, the promotional, you know, the, the the promotional blurb is that they're in the Vatican Secret Library of Blasphemy. I think we read this last week. So, I don't know about last week. I know we've read at least some something to the effect of that before. Yeah, either last week or the week before. Yeah, because I know I've got the one for next week coming up next. But first, can we glean anything from these? It, looks, it looks like Capaldi's sitting in... Uh, is that the Oval Office? I see like it, Missy. It looks like it, it might looks be like, the Oval Office. It looks like the Oval yep. Office set from uh, Day of the Moon. Yeah, because that's uh, that's a replica of the uh, the desk. Um, and an alien there, the one of mm -hmm. the uh, rotting bat looking people. I, mean, I, in the I don't really recognize it. It doesn't have like WWE people or country singers shirtless behind it and stuff. So mm -hmm. it's not like the Oval Office of modern day. Yeah, and there's a quick little mm -hmm. glimpse of Missy here with a bunch of people with staves for some reason. Yep. Yeah, it looks like part of this might be either off-world or in like a medieval setting or something. Oh, that's look really like a this looks setting. very off-world. Very off-world, yeah. Cause, yeah, because yeah, cause those staffs that? do not look like anything in history. That yeah, or like some sort of like secret like cult in like a hidden place, but... There's also a little bit of infrastructure. That they do look like alien technology looking more closely at them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you look at some of the designs and stuff, it looks to be them trying to do some form of alien culture. It's it's Game of Alien Thrones. <laughs> so it's it's either like an alien city on Earth or just straight up being on an alien planet. And, um, let's see, anything else in particular? No, more of the red robe guys. Uh, the doctor sitting in a big black chair inside of what almost looks to be like a cell, with a table in front of him. Um, um, I I did see one article that I did not include because we had so much news that mentioned that the scene of uh, the scene from the season trailer of the doctor partially regenerating matches the outfit that we see of him in uh, the same setting that Missy's in. Um, so it's speculated that he's partially regenerating during this to fix his eyesight. Possibly. That, that might make some sense. That could be a possibility, yeah. And um, that's not so much of a cell as a security cage. Um, it's something that certain libraries that contain really old materials use to uh, store um, very restrictive books. Yeah, I, I didn't know what to call it, but the, a cell is about the best thing They refer. They usually it. refer to it as a cage. I they mentioned that on never to put the doctor in a cage or that's a trap. Also, uh, Missy's hair looks very unkept. Mhm. Mm yeah, looks, she looks a little crazed. Yeah. Well, if she's Good. the one that's been in the uh behind the door, she might not be in the best of shape right now. Again, that's purely speculation on my part. I'm just oh, guessing. Although that that is one thing we did not mention last week is that one of uh, Missy's favorite songs was being played on the piano by whoever was behind the door. Pop Ooh. Goes the Weasel? Yeah. Did we mention the doctor being electrocuted? He looks uh, like he has... Oh, you're saying, in, you're saying in, in the images here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
He has I'm, some I'm, sort of electrodes attached to his head and is yelling in pain. Yeah, there's like a lighted box with an orange light coming out of it right next to his hand. Maybe it's that's a what detector. Maybe. <laughs> or maybe it's something he's trying to use to restore a sight. That's also possible. Uh, one thing like I don't think we've one thing I don't think we've said yet is that uh, it looks uh, almost as if these monks may be working for the Vatican because they're all in the the library setting with the holy book that is the focus of the episode. So they're either invading the Vatican or they oh actually they may be the victims of the book. That's and if you possible. look, there's also one in the Oval Office up there. Mm -hmm. mm. So it's only been in two settings so far. Right. So we'll have to wait so and they, see on but that. But they, they, they seem to be related to the book. Mm -hmm. That's about it. Okay. Mm. So um, then we have the synopsis for the episode after Extremis, Pyramid at the End of the World. Um, and this was released, uh, uh, I think this was released shortly after our last podcast. Yeah. Um, the synopsis is a 5,000 year old pyramid stands at the center of a war zone where the Chinese, Russian, and American armies are about to clash there are many problems with that but the one that intrigued the doctor is this there wasn't a pyramid there yesterday the doctor, Bill, and Nardo face an alien invasion unlike any other and before conquest can begin these aliens need the consent of the human race and this is apparently uh, the episode where we're going to start seeing the UN Special Forces shirts. Yep. And Nardole, it looks like, comes along for the ride. Hmm. Instead of being a grumpy old man back uh, at the university. He's a proper companion now. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Probably against his wishes, but... And this is, of course, the episode that is going to kick off the second half of the series since uh, Extremis is going to be uh, the middle of it, the, the, the end of the first half. So, and I have heard Missy's involved with this one as well, but uh, I don't have confirmation of that. We'll have to wait and see. All um, right. Uh, moving on to spinoffs. All right, so the ratings for season one of Class on the BBC America have finally come in. So, at least as much as come out that's come out thus far. All right, so we've got I'm trying to read these things here. All right, so we've got uh, episode one which aired on uh, April 15th. Uh, the demographic 18 to 49 uh, did point one nine. I don't even know how they rate the demographic stuff. Yeah. All right, so viewers in the millions was point five three five. so 535,000. A touch over half a million. Yeah. All right, season two, which aired on April 22nd, did uh, 300, uh, 305,000. Oh, wow. And they just yeah, keep going it, it, down just... and down and down. Mm. Uh, okay, so April 29th, uh, the third episode aired uh, to about 258,000. Scooch over a quarter million. Mm hmm. Uh, the fourth season, or the fourth episode aired. Um, May fifth, May sixth, at two hundred fifty-seven thousand. Barely a diff difference there. Yeah, and then uh, May thirteenth, the fifth episode has aired to two hundred five thousand. Yeah, and that definitely dropped. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I would say it's not doing so well. No, that sank like a rock pretty fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, half a million for with. the United States is, um, it's pretty small. Yeah, even for specialty programs. And, and uh, keeping in mind that the half the people watching that tuned in for uh, Doctor Who. Doctor yeah, Who they, and just for uh, the uh, damn it, I'm trying to remember the name of the episode, but the the season the season premiere and just hung around for class. Pilot. 
Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, it was the pilot. I was I was thinking the 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 working title, I guess, was the one I was trying to come up with. As if you would have told us what your what you, the name of the what you're looking for, it would have been faster. But anyway, yeah, that they they shut up for pi, after pilot just went, oh, it's a Doctor Who spinoff, and apparently a good uh, 42 percent of them said that wasn't very good. <laughs> Yeah, it's we. I mean, you know, we ourselves, you know, saw this, and we we rated classes mediocre to bad, and it looks like uh, everybody's agreeing with us. So odds are, I do see the occasional people on Facebook demanding a season two and saying yeah. how great it is, and how they're looking forward to the season continuing. But I don't know if they're going to be holding that all the way through the finale. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there are people saying on the even on the comments on this web page here. If you scroll down, you'll see uh, Crystal says that it's a sad imitation of Teen Wolf and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It's not very well written. The plots of each episode are very similar to past episodes of Doctor Who, but without the TARDIS, the characters are one-dimensional. Yeah. If it's... I hear if I hear that girl without a heart call herself nice again, I swear. <laughs> Uh, Luke also is pointing out the, uh, is well aware of the abysmal ratings back in the UK and cannot see this being commissioned for a second season. Yeah, it's... And the marketing was pretty crap, too. Mm -hmm. Well, I I honestly thought BBC America knew it was crap. That's one of the reasons they delayed it and thought they could catch people that would just hang on and watch it after Doctor Who. They did, and then they all decided this wasn't worth it and have stopped showing up <laughs> in pretty fast order so far. Well, the fact is that most of the diehard Doctor Who fans did what we did and got a hold of a copy from the UK. Okay, and maybe so they would have someone... watched it again if it was good, but they didn't. <laughs> so Luke also goes on to respond to another comment. Uh, he makes kind of an interesting point, is that when Torchwood was announced, it got away with uh, the adults only from the moment it was announced, because that's what it was marketed as. Class was promoted as a teen series, however, it has quite a lot of blood, gore, and sex in it for a teen series. Teens generally aren't afraid of that stuff, so I'm not sure what the point there is. I don't know. No, I I don't uh, totally agree with that part of what Luke says. Yeah, I I mean, there there used to be worse stuff. (laughs) Class just boils down to the fact that the person that was show running it had never run a show before. Yeah, and the person who should have been show running it was probably if if giving him the bare minimum amount of assistance rather than giving it proper attention, uh, like RTD had given Sarah Jane and Torchwood. Yeah, because remember, uh, Torchwood was largely um, while RTD had an exec on it, he wasn't the one running it. It mm. was, I think, at the beginning, at least Chibnall. It was. But, it was. Yeah, there was a lot of Chibnall involved, and there was Chibnall. I think was pretty inexperienced at the time too. Yes, but RTD was giving him a lot of help, and Torchwood was still mediocre at times. Mm-hmm. But now Chibnall's gotten a lot better. But we'll see how he does with Doctor Who. Um, let's move on. Mm-hmm. Radio Times, hello. All right, so we uh, now we have a series of uh, interviews with Michelle Gomez. Uh, so the first is uh, a little bit more uh, lighthearted and anecdotal. Uh, apparently, uh, there were some surprises for Michelle when she came in uh, as well. As uh, those who have been paying attention uh, to our podcast and the news know, uh, John Sims' incarnation of the Master is scheduled to appear... Uh, in, uh, I'm not sure if this is an actual photo or it's photo. Sh- I think it's Photoshop. It's, it's a Photoshop. But it's they Photoshop. Photoshop. Some yeah, it. because I don't think we had confirmed which story he was appearing in, but they're saying it's the the finale with the Cybermen. I don't know if that's confirmed yet or not. But um, either way, we knew that he was going to be appearing in an episode opposite Michelle Gomez. Uh, so uh, Michelle said. Uh, well, you're going to find out that everything that happens is all a bit odd, and it's all about the shock. Uh, because I didn't really know what was happening until the read-through. I hadn't read the script. I thought, oh, I'll just leave it this year, and at the read-through, I'll really enjoy it all unfolding as we all get together. 
I walked into the read through and John was sitting there. It didn't even register. I thought, oh, it's John. It's nice to see John. And I was sitting next to him and we started reading and it was obvious that I hadn't read the script because I started shrieking at things as various events unfolded in that episode. (laughs) To be a fly on the wall in that room. I would I I, you know, sometimes they tape those things. I really wish there was a recording. I I hope they have footage of that, yes. Maybe yeah, maybe you can show um in like the behind the scenes featurettes like after the episode airs and such. That would be brilliant. Mm -hmm. I that's one of the reasons I miss Doctor Who Confidential. (laughs) I think they have something like it on on there still, but they it's, don't. It's not like, as thorough as confidential. Yeah. Speak. They don't air, and they don't air the American side either. So. Yeah, which really sucks. Uh, um, and sh- uh, she also mentions that Moffat presented her and John with a really exciting acting challenge, which she thinks hopefully has worked. Hmm. Uh, so we have seen John Sims Master in that trailer that was posted on here too. So, which trailer? Uh, it's uh, the one posted tens. in the Rio Times. Yep. Oh, you're series saying in 10. that? Um, yeah, they the actually se- show a oh, shot the, of the him. series ten trailer. trailer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. that was the one that was like after the end of episode one. I think. Yeah, the the yeah. one that they were like, "There's a spoiler coming, everybody!" And then all of a sudden they were like, "Ah, fuck it, we'll just announce it." <laughs> yeah. yeah. Don't basically. watch because it's a spoiler. Nah, it's John Sims. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, um, we continue with another Michelle Gomez article uh, who mentions that since uh, Stephen and Peter, uh, Stephen Moffat and Peter Capaldi are leaving, uh, she's going to go too. She says, what, what, what would she do without them? Who would she be? Nah, it's done now. It's the end of a chapter. Uh, so she is essentially intentionally kind of closing off her period as Missy uh, as part of the Moffat era. That's kind of a good thing, though. Maybe you know, have our guests appear for a uh, regeneration or something, maybe, but yeah. Mm-hmm. It just occurred to me what they might be doing. Hmm. I'm wondering if Missy somehow breaks time and that causes her to unregenerate. Oh. No. Oh. <laughs> hmm. That would not be I beyond the I master. Don't... Yeah. Hmm. I think the I mean that definitely is... sounds like something the master would like to do, but Missy seems to enjoy being a girl too much to intentionally return to being John Sim. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Unless there's something to gang out of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The the only... yeah, sorry. The only theory I've ever seen was like someone suggesting that maybe she was trying to f- sort of um sort of self-fulfilling prophecy of making her regeneration happen retroactively or something? I don't know. <laughs> That's a possibility, mm. too. Oh, you think, like, she is going to kill John Sim and regen- he'll regenerate into her? Something like that. And then maybe something will accidentally regenerate her at the same time. Oops. Mm-hmm. It, w- <laughs> it would be like a master plan that would suddenly be foiled somehow. Mm. Mm-hmm. No pun intended. <laughs> Well, um, (laughs) I saw part of an interview with her where she was talking about this. It might have been one of the other related articles that had pieces where she Mm -hmm. refers to the situation as her and John Sims like it's two heads in one body. Ah. So Hmm. I'm I'm trying to to puzzle all this out. Interesting. Hmm. Oh, oh, there's a little bit more here. She mentions that it was uh, probably one of the best jobs she's ever had. Uh, the fact that she is a you know a woman of her age that's uh who an, who who is an ass kicking action uh, persona, uh, she says that she won't miss the corset which actually features also in the next article uh, which because that was agony, and that she's a woman who likes a big lunch. It's not fun to wear after you've had two helpings and dessert. <laughs> 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 She won't miss the weather in Wales, but she will miss Wales. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she says nice things about the crew and such. She likes her desserts. Right. <laughs> I believe at some point in one of the other interviews, she also says um, she's, you know, in a few years, she's, you know, might say she'll come back for a special like, you know, Sims is doing now. Right. <laughs> 
So she's up for that, but this is going to be her last. Uh, like, like I mentioned, actually, her, yeah. And there's also something story. in the next one. Now, when she came out with, uh, when she had that interview, she announced around the same time that she was going to be doing a Reddit AMA, uh, which had also completed, you know, between that time and this uh, recording or streaming. So, uh, Blog Tour Who was nice enough to kind of round up those questions and. Uh, you know, put them into a readable format rather than trying to dig through Reddit. Uh, just going to run down through uh, the ones that stand out. Uh, when she was asked her favorite part about being in Doctor Who, she says the freedom to do and say and be anything she wants. Obviously, being good is not an option. Uh, her favorite episode that she's appeared in uh, was the last episode of Series 8 on the steps of St. Paul's Cathedral with a Cyberman backdrop. Uh, her favorite Missy line so far is tell him the bitch is back. Uh, her favorite type of muffin is blueberry, but she's also partial to carrot raisin. <laughs> carrot uh, and raisin. <laughs> yeah. I was uh, going to say carrot raisin. That sounds I, like a I, really I, I odd I took that mix. to mean a single type of like a carrot cake with raisins in it because I know that is a type of muffin. I, I, I think her favorite flavor of muffin is muffin. <laughs> <laughs> But blueberry did get first mention, and blueberries are uh, blueberry muffins are good. Mm -hmm. uh, her favorite time working with the Royal Shakespeare Company, or her favorite part about it, was uh, getting uh, getting used to uh, working out and saying uh, all the vowel sounds, and you know, being able to pronounce the words. She says she probably got more out of it than the audience did. Her favorite memory on set was uh, walking into the studio for uh, The Magician's Apprentice, or probably The Witch's Familiar, actually, uh, with every generation of Dalek. It's hard to draw a fine line between Missy and Michelle. Um, she has no say in the outfits Missy wears, which is a marked difference between... Uh, her role in Peter, because I believe it's been said that Peter picks all of his own clothing. I guess uh, Stephen picked all of Michelle's clothing. Hmm. And it's the corset, yeah. Yeah, That's she, the corset, mentions, the she, cor she mentions it's a great image, but a bloody tight corset. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a little... Some of the answers are a little vague, but it does seem that more or less she has she's had complete freedom to interpret the script, the mannerism, characteristics, etc., um, in order to best portray, you know, what she thinks Moffat is looking for. Um, if she could meet up with any previous doctor, it would be uh, t um, Tom Baker and John Pertwee. She would like to go to Paris with them for a croissant, and she probably pronounced it in the proper French way, but I definitely could not. Mm -hmm. On the, again, cannot I cannot pronounce Champs Elysses. Uh, followed by a great tower. <laughs> uh, the funniest thing that's happened on set was shoving Clara down a hole. Uh, she, <laughs> well, let's face it. If you could shove Clara down a hole, you would, too. Uh, she, has, she has definitely <laughs> taken uh, props home for souvenirs. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, hey, Missy, you're so fine was an ad lib of hers that, that <laughs> got kept great. That was a great ad-lib, too. Mm -hmm. um, it was not intentional that a Scottish master and a Scottish doctor showed up at the same time. At least not that she knows of. Moffat might have a different story. <laughs> um, if she could pick who to act alongside again, it would be Peter Capaldi. She says, uh, probably tongue-in-cheek, that she didn't even notice Jenna left because she was only paying attention to Peter. <laughs> Um, and that she could not, and that she will not say how she would, uh, whether or not she would like to work with uh, David Tennant's doctor, uh, because she's bound to Peter Capaldi. God. Uh, ironically, the person who asked that question uh, was had the username Harold Saxon the Master. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just a perfect. Just you can, you John the Sims master that after that, that. that after episode twelve is done, Capaldi's taking Michelle Gomez home on a leash. I don't think his wife would be happy to hear that. I know, but by the way it's worded. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, her I weirdest her? fan encounter was having her autograph tattooed on flesh because uh, she says her t handwriting is terrible. <laughs> um, 
If she, when asked to describe Missy in Series 10 in three words, is strong, fragile hostility. Uh, she would like John Oliver to play the next Doctor. She would like to team up with the Silence. Um, and uh, if uh, she's encouraging people to campaign for a Missy spinoff. Hmm. Oh, no. oh, and uh, she's really happy to have been turned into an action figure and also to appear in a Mr. Men book with no apparent clothes on. Uh, yes. Ooh. Oh, my. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, from here, we go to our media section. And the first thing we should note is that Germany is getting a DVD release of the classic episode, Caves of Androzani. Germany, hey. look out. Uh, good one's coming your way. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. This will be dubbed in German specifically for the release. Um, this, it should note that no German dub exists for any story prior to the Twin Dilemma, with the exception of the Five Doctors. So, this is a first. So this will be the second one, actually. Except for the Five Doctors. No, I mean, well, the, I mean, this uh, for the serial, it is a first. But for the serial in particular, this will be the first time, yes. And Germany yep, gets to see It has never been one. broadcast on German television. Um. So it is coming out uh, on DVD. Um, does it give me a date? Twenty fifth of uh, August, yes. twenty seventeen. For the collector's edition, this is a limited run. Um, this edition looks like a book and will feature an extensive booklet and the English and German language soundtracks and subtitles. Ooh. Includes all special features that can be found on the regular UK special edition DVD. And then the regular edition itself, which is going to be the same as the uh, Media Book One, only in a regular DVD slipcase, will be on the 13th of October. Mm -hmm. It is not currently available for free order, but probably will be soon. Probably very soon. All right, from there we go to books. Aaron. All right, well. Uh, Brigitte Lethridge Stewart's fiance Sally is taking a more central role in the upcoming story, The Daughters of Earth, which is the next in the long line, uh, so far 11 books, of the uh, Lethridge Stewart novel series. So this sounds pretty interesting. Apparently, they made up uh, the author, um, Sarah Groenwagen. Uh, who has also written the short story The Lock-In um, said that she was uh, compelled to make a uh, 19, come up with a 1960s uh, peace movement uh, led specifically by women which are the focus of this main story so basically the uh, the synopsis is this, to celebrate Lethard Stewart's birthday, a romantic weekend is planned for him and Sally Wright in a remote cottage in the Scottish Highlands Unfortunately for Sally, freak weather causes her to crash her car. Lethridge Stewart, meanwhile, in Cairngorm, uh, investigating UFO sightings with Ann Travers and Lieutenant Bishop. Elsewhere, the Daughters of Earth, a woman-only peace movement, are making waves in the political world. But just who is their enigmatic leader, and what links the Daughters with the events of Cairngorm and uh, Sally's accident? Done. Sounds pretty cool. Well, we know that the Brigadier doesn't marry Sally. Because he doesn't get married until after his unit days, and the person he marries is named Doris. Hmm. We know that from the episode Battlefield. Do we um, know yeah. that he wasn't a widower, though? Yeah. Um, as far as I'm aware, uh, he was not married during his unit era. I mean, uh, like, no, but ever I, but I mean, had is, been is married. It, it, is it possible that he was a widower during the Pertwee era? That we, you no, know, like I just said, as far as we're aware, he had never been married during the unit era. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so far, Sally has actually been in all of the series in the back, as kind of a background character in the first 11 novels right from the beginning. Um, and apparently, I don't think she... I haven't read any of them, but she doesn't start working with him right away. Like, she, she eventually becomes an actual official officer in the Corps. And this is kind of her take on working with the Brigadier and how she decided to join up the, with the Corps and, um, 
you know, her her feelings on duty and uh, the adventures that she has. So, if All you're right. a fan of the character, that's this is her time to shine. All right. So from here, we move to games. Bill? All right. So the BBC has announced a new mobile browser game by the name of Time Vortex 360, uh, in which you essentially uh, use... Uh, I don't know if it's... what I guess it's called 360 technology. Uh, in which, um. I know what that is. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a game designer to use the proper terminology, but you essentially uh, use the gyroscope of your phone to uh, go through a, I guess you'd call it an asteroid field simulator. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of a of, a, of an appropriate game from the Atari era to compare it to, but one's not coming to mind because all the ones that would come to mind you can shoot back, and in this one you can't. It's very simple. Basically, if you uh, if you've ever seen a post on Facebook where it's like, oh, turn your phone to see the entirety of this post, yeah, and you actually it's, it's, move your phone. Yeah, it's, it's using that tech, but it's uh, you're dodging like asteroids and obstacles like that. It's essentially uh, asteroids uh, without uh, a laser blaster. Oh, it, it's an endless runner game. Okay. Yeah, hmm. a racing game without the other racers. Yeah. I don't know. I'm guessing the objective is to survive for until the end yeah. of the uh, course or something. Try it was designed as well. a mobile. It was designed as a mobile first experience for the BBC by Good Boy Digital, combining cutting edge HTML5 and WebGL using Pixie JS version 5.0. The game is available to play on BBC Taster, where fans can rate the game and provide feedback. Um, to play, uh, you use your smartphone browser to go to BBC dot in slash dw360 um, hmm. and that's about it to it um, seeing if the quote here says anything their quote doesn't really say anything so that's okay. really all there is to say about that alright from there we move to our big finish news and the first thing is what's currently released uh, coming out in the main range for Doctor Who uh, Vortex, Vortex Ice, Cortex Fire, uh, with Colin Baker and Lisa Greenwood, uh, was released uh, yesterday. And uh, this is, of course, the Doctor and Flip arrive seven feet underground in a mine in northern Mexico, only to run into a scientific expedition. Among their number, an exobiologist. They're all on the run on the hunt for alien life. Deep underground, the team finally uncovers a state of vast crystals like ice despite the heat and inside the crystals something frozen something trapped in time if only it were something simple like a monster but it's far worse than that and then on the on the other end of it because these are two short stories rather than one long is the doctor brings flip to the futuristic city of Festin the best vantage point to witness a unique astronomical light show in a city governed by the all-powerful network known as the Cortex, they're soon identified as outsiders, nihilists perhaps, responsible for a wave of terror that's been sweeping the city. But the truth is different. The people of Festlin are burning up, spontaneously combusting, and no one knows why. Wow, all the freaking broken sentences in those descriptions. <laughs> <laughs> Sentence fragments, just phrases. And like I said, that is out yesterday. It is available for twelve pounds ninety nine pence download and fourteen ninety nine on CD, or it can be par bought as part of a six or twelve story subscription. All right. Also out is the fourth Doctor Adventures, The Haunting of Malkin Place. Uh, this is Tom Baker and Lala Ward and is directed by Nicholas Briggs. And that was released today. Mm. Uh, whilst on the way to visit the birthplace of Mr. James, a chance encounter with a spiritualist on a train sends the Doctor and Romana on the trail of a ghost. It's the most convincing case of haunting he's ever heard, he tells them. And so on their arrival, does it appear to be. Things go bump in the night at Malcolm Place. The voice of a crying child, birds bursting into flight strange movements in a seance. 
The doctor has determined there must be a rational explanation. But is science always the answer to everything? And that is available for eight pounds ninety nine pence uh, for download or ten ninety nine for CD. It is also available as part of the Doctor Who Fourth Doctor bundles. And finally, our big big finish news is the announcement of the upcoming release of the Tenth Doctor Adventures Volume Two. If you remember, uh, the Tenth Doctor Adventures Volume One was David Tennant and Catherine Tate in a series of adventures that we more or less liked. And if you don't remember, shame on you, because we talked about that like half an hour ago. Shame. <laughs> yep. And this one features David Tennant and and uh, come for our first, uh, first major appearance in Big Finish, Billy Piper will be there for the series of, I believe it's six adventures. Three, it three, three, three adventures, three? I believe. Yeah. Okay. Same as last time. Okay, so three adventures. Uh, the set opens with Attack of the Zaros by John Dorney, in which an alien invasion of Earth isn't quite what it appears to be. Camille Coudry guest stars as Jackie Tyler on this. Uh, the second adventure, Sword of the Chevalier by Guy Adams. The Doctor and Rose arrive in Slough in 1799 and encounter Chevalier Dion, a enigmatic ex-spy who has lived his life as a woman. Together they must fend off alien slavers who have come to Earth to abduct valuable humans. And then finally, Cold Vengeance by Matt Fitton. The TARDIS arrives on Cold Star, a vast frozen food asteroid in deep space. But there is something sinister defrosting in the network of storage units. The Doctor's old enemies, the Ice Warriors. Why does every Ice Warrior title need to be a pun? <laughs> it wouldn't be Ice Warriors if it wasn't. Um, so I listened to the trailer, and I was actually rather impressed. I don't know about you, Bill, because I think you said you did too. Um, I did, and uh, one thing that stood out to me, and this had been mentioned to me before, but I think I would have noticed it either way, but uh, back in the... 2008, it was said that Billy Piper had to rewatch her old episodes in order to uh, nail her accent and, you know, Rose Tyler's speech. And I don't know if she did that this time or not, but she did not really sound like she was nailing Rose's speech patterns here. Mm. I actually didn't notice that. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, I, I noticed that Tennant sounded more like himself than he had in a while, but then again, he just came off on doing this for, uh, you know, volume one. Right. I know uh, oh, that's the only complaint I've heard about the 50th anniversary is that uh, his uh, his doc his 10th Doctor accent was a little um, mixed. Hmm. Uh, the the uh, the uh, adjective form of Dick Van Dyke is how I actually I think that's how the 11th Doctor described it. But now I'm not sure. It's hard to tell what's <laughs> fan commentary and what's meta commentary. Um, other than that. This sound this sounded pretty good. I don't think anything stood out to me as you know really amazing or really terrible. Um, I think it just sounded you know like you know the things you'd expect to amp up attention. It sounded pretty good from what I heard. Well, it sounds like something I'd be willing to listen to. I don't know about you. Yeah, there's just um, so much big finish on my plate. It's not going to be on my early shopping list, but <laughs> I would definitely listen to it if I if if someone lent it to me. Well, um, we'll have to bear this one in mind. Yep. Um, also, uh, on the cover, that... that appears to be more Cassandra than uh, Rose because uh, that particular configuration of that shirt is how Cassandra wore it. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, that's just where they stole the picture from. Probably. Um, unfortunately, um, they did have this on a special... Uh, or they had the volume one to celebrate on a special, but that was a 24 hour special that already expired. No. Um, they have, do not have a listing for when you'll be able to pre order volume two. All uh, right. Ju just like last time, and I apologize if Fran already said this, I don't know, uh, but this will be uh, both as three individual releases and as a limited edition deluxe box set. Okay. Now, I was in a hurry to move on because we still got a bit of news we want to cover. Gotcha. Um, moving on to our other sci-fi and fantasy. Aaron? Mm. All mm. right. So we've gotten finally a uh, trailer for the new Star Trek Discovery. 
which is coming to, I believe it's uh, CBS All Access, which is CBS's, it's CBS's online, um, basically their online channel or online service similar to Netflix and CW Seed and a lot of these other places. And this is produced specifically for, for All Access. Am I right, guys? Yeah, it's All Access in the United States. So in we, Canada, it's Space's Crave TV, which is the exact same thing for their Space Channel, and the rest of the world will get it on Netflix. Okay, and then there's also going to be an after show called Talking Trek. So it looks like the uh, the Talking Dead stuff has really taken off. So. Yeah, I've never been impressed by it, but yeah. What is a Talking Dead? Uh, the after, after the, show? the yeah the Walking after the Walking Dead airs. Uh, What's his face? The the, the the geek guy. Um it's the nerdist. It's uh Yeah, the he he actually gets don't a, remember his name. He gets three, four people Chris together. Chadwick. Chris Chadwick, thank you. Gets three, four people together. Sometimes related to the show. Usually at least one of them's related to the show and others of them are just general celebrities to discuss the episode they just saw. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And is this a long form or a short form? Uh, it's usually about an hour. At least it was when I was watching it. Gotcha. An hour, half an hour, and then so they it's like eat. a so it's like a much better version of what we do. Yeah, a, a, much. A, 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 it's like uh, what we do with a budget. <laughs> mm -hmm. A budget and less about the news. This is probably also very similar to. Um, let me see here to what Thomas's um, his Whovians show does with Doctor Who where you have people sitting on a couch talking and some of them will be celebrities or internet stars or something like that and they'll be talking about their impressions of the show okay. and what it was like to film it. So less about talking Trek, more about the trailer. All right. Um, I know at least three, four of us have seen it. What do we think? It was okay. I thought it was all right. As as yeah. a first uh, look trailer goes. I, it's a... I... Go ahead, Randy. I'm a bit of a hardcore Trekkie. I mean, I was a big, huge fan back in the 90s, back when I didn't have a Doctor Who to sate my palate. And this is kind of a mixed bag to me. It gets, it, it has some things that look okay and other things that look wrong. It's very hard when you're doing a prequel show. You have to get your facts straight, your costumes right and everything, and they're getting none of it right. On that mark, the uh, the new ship they've replaced the original prototype that we saw for the ship with the one that looks better, um, and the acting looks okay, but I'm not quite sure about anything else. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm I, not quite as knowledgeable uh, as Ran is, so I'm just kind of looking at it as kind of being its own show. So mm -hmm. the the biggest thing that stands out to me is a prequel element, and that's concern over Spock seems to be playing a large enough role for him to be on the poster I think that's him which makes me wonder if they're going no, to no it's, that it's up. not that's that not him that, that, that's not that close up of an eye that's a chick up. that's a woman oh okay that's I thought it was a I thought it was, just, I thought it was a young boy alien racist <laughs> yeah no they they, they 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 had it briefly in the trailer that's a, there's apparently a female Vulcan yeah somewhere in here and I'm kind of wondering what the hell because that also breaks Star Trek canon. yeah Spock is yeah. supposed to be the first to have served right or the no? first Vulcan to serve with a human crew yeah there or are the first all... to serve as a member of Starfleet no, no. no. because False. wasn't the Vulcans are part of Starfleet Vulcan? Bill the, the Spock mm -hmm. is the first to not be on a ship solely them yeah uh, about the same time as the Enterprise there's also the Intrepid that was manned entirely mm -hmm. by Vulcans the, but what I mean is, wasn't there a Vulcan on, in Enterprise, which you said before yes, this? Yes, but yeah. she wasn't technically part of. Um, she was. She wasn't part of Starfleet. And, right. That's uh, that's why I was saying I thought it was that Spock was the first to serve as a member of Starfleet. No, he's the first to serve in Starfleet with a human crew. There's there's modifiers, and by the way, Enterprise also fucked that up. But we'll talk about that. Basically, uh, the original series canon says that the Vulcans basically kept to themselves for as a very far long as time until Spock. Command. Yeah, yeah. Was was Spock in this trailer? I couldn't tell. That he was, was, a, I he was just... Spock. 
there, there, there was there was a young boy that they referred to him being too human to learn Vulcan, which makes it sound yeah, very, too, very much like it's too, about Spock. I thought I thought they were talking to the female about her I, tongue being too I, human. I don't know what they're where they're going with that. They, we didn't get enough info. Yeah, there's yeah. not enough info. Yeah, Bill's making assumptions, and Aaron's making assumptions, and I'm making assumptions, and we all could freaking be wrong. Uh, about yeah, all like, of it. I thought there was a female Vulcan that they were talking about. I don't know. It was kind of confusing, too. Um, I mean, they got the epic feeling down, I feel, from the movies. Well, with the ship rising up and them kind of walking through a desert, you know, waste or a desert alien planet, which does kind of feel kind of lonely and out there. There's plenty of very, it does feel like it takes place in space and not, you know, solely on a ship or something like that. But for me, the camera work and the lighting kind of signaled it as being more of a television slash Netflix type of production rather than, you know, it's not cheap enough to look like a TV show and it's not expensive looking enough to for a movie kind of feel. So it's kind of a weird in between. We'll have to see what comes of it because it gives us some information, but not enough. Okay. Um, might I also add in? Uh, I uh, since I was also one of the people that got to watch the trailer, but I believe uh, I got butted out of being able to say anything right away. Oh, sorry. Um, but um, I saw it, and at first it felt like it was going in an okay direction, and then more stuff kept getting revealed little messed up bits and it's just like not only did the trailer get a little bit convoluted towards the middle but some of the things we have mentioned before that are absolutely wrong are still in here like the Klingons I didn't see Klingons in there but oh, people no. show Klingons. Them. they showed the Klingons where They're were the they? the Klingons from like the movies the new movies yeah. so they don't look like classic um, Klingons or I believe it. I believe these are the Klingons at uh, one minute twenty one seconds. Yeah, probably. I mean, granted, and, I did. I did only watch it once quickly, so I'll definitely be watching it. And they it again. Uh, look if terrible. those. I'm hoping those aren't Klingons. They look like the Klingons they were I'm, saying oh, that they had screen caps of before. Yes, I know, but those. But that was people taking a screen caps of stuff, saying, "Hey, these must be the new Klingons." So this could also be a completely different alien. Race. Uh, keep in mind we had voiceover that was pointing the. Yes, they are. Yes, they are the Klingons, and that's they are. Then, then, uh, then, then, we then, had then, voiceover of them being called the Klingons. Then no, they fail. Mm -hmm. Go away. The brown Klingons skin kind of reptilian-looking people. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they 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 fail. Go home. The, the, I'm sorry, the Klingons weren't the half breed of Gorn the last time I checked, but that. Makes yeah, me... and. And they didn't even have brow ridges in this era. Nope. Oh, that's actually part of canon. They look yes, like they is. have spikes along their shoulder. Like I said, like they're part reptilian or something. Anyway, well, guys, we are armor. going anyway, over. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Bill yeah. wanted a few minutes to talk about Guardians of the Galaxy 2. All right. Okay. And he has a few minutes. <laughs> All right. So I'll uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, I'm going to say that it is my opinion that uh, while it's a, a good movie, but not as good as the original, and I'm going to say the main reason for that is that while the good movie straddled the line between having just enough comedy and too much, this actually goes a little bit over the line into too much to the point where it almost feels more like a parody movie at, at times. Uh, the vast uh, majority of the serious moments were followed up by a punchline, and it got mm -hmm. to the point where... When a serious moment came, I sort of assumed there would be a punchline, which kind of hurt the feeling of the movie for me. Uh, visually, it was spectacular. Um, there were a lot of things that were well done. Um, and this, the issue that I mentioned is not present during the last, I want to say, 15 minutes of the movie or so. But I did personally feel that it detracted from the experience uh, during, uh, during certain portions of the main movie. I could not So while I do recommend it, I do not I do not agree with those that say that it's as good or better than the first one. I mm. could not disagree with you more, Bill. I think it's better than the original. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the lightheartedness of it. Apparently it was too lighthearted for you, but I everyone else I've talked to has said mm. it's absolutely perfect. So yeah. uh, you're you're standing alone in the corner, Bill. Not, not completely go, alone. Go I've talked your to head. a few people with similar opinions, but it mm -hmm. definitely seems to be the minority opinion, which I'm okay with. 
Well, it's, you know, it's it's important to hear from different points of view with this kind of stuff, you know, too. Like, I never realized it, but there is quite a lot of comedy in, in the second Guardians movie compared to the first. Yes, but he's disagreeing with me so he can get in the corner and put on his cap. <laughs> he also mentions the fact that uh, Wonder Woman, um, he didn't see a trailer for Wonder Woman in front of Guardians, neither did we. Mm -mm. Um... Which Wait, is kind of weird, we considering it comes out in two weeks. Did we? Randy doesn't seem to remember it. Thought we did. I don't remember. Uh, I don't. I I don't, I don't remember, remember, for remember it. Oh my god! <laughs> we got Wonder Woman cups. Yeah, we got we got Wonder Woman cups from uh, because uh, we go on Tuesday. They get these plastic cups that if you get a large soda. Oh okay. So we got the Wonder Woman promo cups. You know, so they, they at up, least got that level of the promo engine going on. If they screw up the Wonder Woman movie in this era of, you know, pretty heavy feminism, yeah, my you know, kind my of ma vibes. My major concern with this movie is that they're cutting the advertising budget, and then they're going to say, well, we gave you a, a movie with a female lead, but nobody watched it. And yeah. I'm, they do I'm, not seem to be doing jack compared to what Marvel's doing at the very least to promote I'm, this movie. I'm more concerned they fucked it up. Yeah. I'm more concerned because DC has not had a good but, movie. I'm, in I'm its just current. saying, even if it's brilliant at this point, nobody's going to watch it because they're not promoting it. That's not necessarily true. Generally, the kind of feeling that we get from these things is when, they, when a company knows they fucked up a movie and are trying to put it out as quietly as possible... Um, so they don't get blasted for putting out a shitty movie. Are they allow? They're allowing for reviewers to review it now, right? I'm pretty sure, yeah. Because if uh, another bad sign is if they don't allow like reviewers any pre-screenings or anything like that. That's, that's a bad sign. also a sign that, that it's that it, they know that's it's a, it's true, a failure of the movie. I don't know who's in charge of this process, but I do know that there are definitely people at WB and people at Marvel that are of the opinion that are basically of the opinion that if it's not a straight white male in the lead that the movie sucks already and i really hope that's not what's driving this decision well it's it's either going to be that or it's a sucky movie that's one or yeah. the other but and, like and, and like i said knowing dc's track record it would not surprise me if it's a sucky movie mm -hmm. because like i said yeah, they haven't come out with a good movie the, the, the best movie they've had was one that was objectively bad but entertaining. Yes. Wait, which what was, which was one? that? Suicide Squad. Oh, huh. Yeah, yeah. Su and Suicide Squad was okay. a bad movie. It's still the best we've seen from their current iteration of movies. Right. And it was mostly because it had a decent soundtrack, and Will Smith did a decent job. Yeah. And so did What's-Her-Face that played... Uh, Margot Robbie. Margot Robbie, mm -hmm. yep. Margot, yeah. See, my brain hears Margot when I'm thinking superhero movies that go straight to Kidder, so I mean, it's just yeah. showing my age. <laughs> anyway, we need to All move right. on now. So, so five move on now. Here's for the five-minute challenge. I did it last time, yes? Yes. Not it. I did it the time before. Bill? You don't want me to do it this time. I was trying <laughs> to, and I don't know if it was the heat or what, but I was not getting the right focus to detail. Tim? <laughs> Uh, I guess I can do it again. Uh, it's either you or uh, Flint. One of you two. We're down to the last either two. You or Thomas. Oh, or Thomas. Thomas. Thomas muted. Is he with us? He's Tom? muted. Thomas, are you with us? Thomas, well, is yeah, I'm with you. Okay. Well, to be honest, I forgot I was muted. <laughs> um, <laughs> Have you been talking and we, and we, we just talked over you? <laughs> because you were muted? Uh, mm, Man, probably. Um, <laughs> baby apart, so, no. I have done that before, so. Because, like, I think I was keeping myself muted just because I was, like, just moving around and stuff and didn't want it to be audible, but yeah. Uh, okay, so um, who wants to do this five-minute challenge here? Uh, I've only seen the episode once, but that was this morning, so I guess I could Recent. give it a shot. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's do okay, it. Okay, we got a volunteer. Okay. Um, just 
Just just for like a reference point, I'll just pull up the wiki page just in case I forget anything. Just don't quote <laughs> from it. Yeah, don't quote from oh, it. Oh yeah, yeah. You I'll just like use it. Fight. Yeah, I'll just I'll use it for reference. I don't mean. All right, ready whenever you are. <coughs> Okay. Okay. Yep. Oh, are you waiting for me or? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I said waiting for what are you when you ever you are. So okay, starting in three, okay. two, one, go. Okay. The episode starts with uh, the doctor kind of just narrating as we see two corpses floating through space. Um, and then we see two people working on the space station, and it's made very clear that their suits are running low on oxygen. Um, as they are finally getting to the hatch to get back in, uh, some of the corpses from earlier turn up and kill one of them. And we're left to just kind of wonder what happens to the lone survivor of that group. Um... And then we cut to the Doctor actually making a university lecture, which we haven't seen since the pilot, <laughs> um, where it turns out he's talking about what happens when you die in space, and it turns out that he was supposed to be doing a lecture on... Um, crop rotation. Crop rotation, that was it. <laughs> um, and Nardole kind of has a go at him for wanting to leave Earth. Uh, because it's just clear that this is a side effect of him missing traveling. Um, which to me kind of indicates that it's probably been a while now. It's probably a couple of weeks or a month or something. Um, and just because he can, the Doctor just decides to go anyway, tricking Nardle into thinking that something that was necessary for the, the TARDIS to work had he had removed and he hadn't so they go to this space station that we saw earlier and <coughs> from there it basically turns out that uh, the only oxygen in this space station is in the suits that the people are wearing and once the ex oxygen runs out in that the suit kills you um, and uh, very early on the doctor's as they're looking around, the Doctor's tar uh, Doctor's sonic screwdriver, sorry, actually gets destroyed by one of these sort of zombies. And he's basically without that for the rest of the episode and probably will be without it for a few more, um, the way things are looking. Um, it turns out that there are four survivors out of the 40 people that were there. Um, and the rest of corpses. Uh, they're forced to go into suits that were actually under repair. Um, and then from there, they end up meeting up with the surviving few. Um, one of them dies. We kind of move ahead as they're trying to get to a new... They're trying to get to, like, the, the middle, I think, of the space station, or, like, generally a certain spot. Uh, but... <coughs> Bill's outfit has been playing up. Her suit has been playing up on her. And it ends up really almost killing her at one point because of a decompression. Um, so the doctor willingly sacrifices himself for Bill to get her through this one part. And when it comes out the other end, it turns out the doctor is side effects of doing that has made him blind um, from there we actually see that he almost what we at least think is that he's let Bill die even though he states that she's not um, with the few remaining survivors of which there at this point are like three I think or two aside from yeah two aside from the Doctor and Nardole uh, and it turns out that Bill wasn't dead at all and the Doctor reactivates something on a suit that brings her back um, 
and the doctor also uh, connects their suits to the cooling system of the space station, which makes it so if they die, they take the space station with them. And when he points out that their deaths will cost more than them surviving, all the suits stop attacking them and they're able to get away, basically. Um, and they give them more oxygen as well, so they can get out. Um, from there, the doctor takes the two remaining survivors to the head office of the company they were working for so they can make a complaint. Um, and when we get back to Earth, uh, basically, the episode ends with not all and the Doctor having a spat, because of course, and the Doctor pointing out that even though it seemed that his eyesight had been restored near the end of the episode, it only really restored the coloration because he is still blind. And that's it. <laughs> oh, so close. You did it in five minutes, 23 seconds. Ooh, oh. damn. <laughs> Just slim down a oh, little well. bit more. Not bad for a first try. Yeah, mm. not bad for a first try. You'll get a hang of it eventually. Yeah. <laughs> Unless it's a long episode, Again. in which case you're jinxed either way. <laughs> mm. Okay, yeah, like, so... Wait, wait till we get a ten-parter again. <laughs> so, what we like about the episode, starting with Aaron. Okay. Gosh, there's so much stuff to like about this episode. I'm Choose totally one. Not, I'm totally not stalling while I bring up my list of stuff, of notes. <laughs> Alright, so let's see here. Um, I actually really like Nardole in this one. He wasn't too much of a... Mo he wasn't as much of a mother hen as in previous episodes. You know, he still voiced his concern, but he also had... He, he had a little bit more of a participation. He was helping the doctor solve some of the problems mm. here. Like, I felt he was participating a little bit more in, once he got into the groove of trying to solve the mystery of what was happening and also trying not to die. He, he <laughs> became a little bit more invested in what was going on and was yeah. like, oh shit, we've got to survive this. He, I think he was also a very slight bit in the Zoe role of the knows as much of the doctor about certain tech things and can take over explaining to the earther. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although obviously Bill doesn't need quite as much explaining as your Jamie McCrimmons and such. He mm -hmm. also <laughs> came off as kind of a nurturing character because he, you know, he was very careful about telling Bill about what had happened to the doctor. He was he also made sure to remind her that he doesn't want to be helped and stuff, so he yeah. was trying to protect Bill as well. He was being a dick to mm -hmm. the doctor because he was pissed off at the doctor, but he wasn't being a dick to everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. Being a dick to the doctor because the doctor was being a dick to him. Yeah, I'm that's sure. true. Yes, yeah, pretty much. Mm -hmm. You can't take off into space. Ah, I'm taking off into space. Fuck you. <laughs> I took you with me, by the way. Ha ha. We should go back to the TARDIS. No, we're not going back to the TARDIS. Lock the oh, doors. look, we're trapped. Fuck you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Matt, what did you like about the episode? I liked the... Um, I, I actually generally liked the atmosphere of it. It felt very claustrophobic like it probably would be in a uh, sp small space station like this one. It, uh, there's enough to it that you did get the sense that they might be in space, and they even had little extra things on, like, the suits and stuff to kind of explain how they stood upright without floating around all the time. They literally had back the in the shoes so strong that they couldn't move their feet at points. Hmm. Uh, which Especially also is, uh, again, something that almost killed Bill. Well, not only that, but they, act, but they, they made things to explain the fact that those suits were basically, like, powered armor in a way. Uh, Only without degree, the armor. Because yeah. <laughs> when that suit went into diagnostic mode, Bill couldn't move. Yeah, it's basically a rig. Yeah. All right, Tim, what did you like about the episode? I liked the idea that it was zombies in space, but it was a very unique twist on that concept. The floating dead. 
Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it is like uh, basically the the dead are just uh, literally puppets. Like it's not the living dead. It's they're, they're still corpses, but they're, they're just yeah, they, going along for the ride. It's more the suits the actually said. doing the uh, work they, than the actual yeah. zombie bodies. They handled it very differently it's than different Star thing. Wars did. I don't. Did Star Trek have a uh, a zombies on the Enterprise or a similar ship episode? Nothing I can think of. I never got Star Wars head zombies. What well, wasn't there an episode of Star Trek that had like a vampire cloud? Yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, there was a but vampire. But it didn't create monster. zombies. It just killed people. Hmm. Yeah, there. Yeah, there's uh, zombie stormtroopers in Star Wars. I'm not sure if that's canon yeah. anymore. Uh, no, it's it's all it's all legends. It was galaxies and uh, a few of the are actually. There was an old. It's part. Yeah, it was tied into the old Republic and to galaxies, and then in some of the novels oh, that are part of the Legends universe. Wait, Star Trek does have space zombies. The oh. Borg. Oh, true, yeah. true. <laughs> yeah. And obviously, yeah. this is handled differently than the Borg as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Borg were communist space zombies, where these are capitalist space zombies. Uh, <laughs> That's yeah. interesting. Looking at it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of uh, you, Bill, uh, you're up next. I'm going to say I liked Bill. Uh, she behaved very believably, and I think, you know, her scenes were some of the most engaging and best uh, of the of the episode. So Bill liked Bill, uh, narcissistic much. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thomas. Um. Uh... See, that's a funny thing. I'm used to being early in the list for these. Well, the, the <laughs> so dice being gods, the the yeah. gods the said dice, otherwise today. The dice rolled low I have you. noticed that I've been, progress been getting progressively lower in the thing, it's, too. So it's that's an weird. absolutely um, random roll. Mm. But, um... <sighs> the, only, the, only the only constant is that I keep myself out of the roll and I keep myself last to give all <laughs> you all a chance to, to do things mm. first. Um... You know, I'd say the the main takeaway from this that I liked was as soon as the Doctor goes blind, I was like, oh, he's going to get his sight back. And then at the end of the episode, it's like, nope, they actually kept that. Um, and I'm saying that specifically because that isn't my favorite scene, so that doesn't technically count for that. But yeah, um, the fact that there was something with that that they actually stuck with that. That there's consequences that and they're sticking with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So I liked the writing in a way that kind of matches Matt's atmosphere, though I think his was more the des the like the set design. Set and design, mine was costume design, but the physical aspects of it. Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. I liked the the atmosphere from the writing standpoint. The it was very mm -hmm. it was very in line in something you would see from the aliens universe, where the cor where everything's run by the big bad corporation who doesn't give a fuck about you. It's basically kind of cyberpunk in space in a way. Mm -hmm. And as I'm a big cyberpunk fan of the evil corporation kind of thing, um, yeah. I really I really appreciated that fact that here's a, here's a corporation that's charging you for the very who is sending you out on the space station. And then charging you for the very air you breathe. Mm -hmm. Yutani has decided that you've been sucking in too much air. Time to die. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's kind of what it felt like. It, it reminded me of something that the corporation and aliens would do. The corporation there was fucking yes, evil, too. Yeah, that definitely felt like the same sort of uh, corporation there. Which is also <laughs> why I uh, kind of raised an eyebrow when people are like, oh, great social commentary. I'm like, really? Because... This feels like something sci-fi's, you know, the same sort of message sci-fi's been giving us since Alien. Ironically, <laughs> ironically, I don't know if this was true in the UK, but here in America, this particular episode was sponsored by Alien Covenant. Ah. <laughs> I'm just like, seriously? <laughs> you couldn't have chose a better episode. <laughs> okay. So now what we didn't like about the episode, Aaron. All right. Um, I, well, this is why I like going first. Wait, would it be counted as a scene? It might be counted as a scene. Never mind. Um, Something overarching, not just one scene. Yeah. 
trying to think, trying to think, trying to think. Are you Winnie the Pooh now? <laughs> no, see, I'm 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 Homer Simpson trying not to pee in bed. <laughs> um, I guess you wet it, you humor? clean it. Well, I guess some of the humor was the, felt a little bit out of place. But not by too much. It's really kind of a nitpick. Um, and I can't really think even of any particular instances where it really felt kind of awkward. I guess maybe Nardle going on on and on about the uh, the voice in the suits about how it was an actress that he had dated, I guess. I He could have just mentioned that kind of quickly or maybe made it aside. Hey, you know, that voice in the suit, I used to date that actress. <laughs> or something like that. So uh, there wasn't really too much that I felt overarching was really bad. Just you know? that it didn't so. hit for you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so occasionally some of the jokes didn't hit. Kay. Due to the atmosphere and everything was so well done. Okay. Uh, Matt? Uh, something that I didn't like. <laughs> Um, I guess one thing I didn't like is that, um, I, I felt like there could have been more to do with the suits being, like, a little more intelligent. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, we did get little tidbits and hints that maybe the suits were listening in and maybe they were trying to figure things out from what people were saying, but I would have thought that they would have been a little faster to catch on than that. Yeah. You, that could have... And that could they could have developed them to be a bit faster and a bit smarter on the uptake, and well, also developed the story into a two-parter. The uh, the thing Not necessarily, is necessarily it could have helped move things faster along. Actually, the th oh, yeah. the, the uh, thing is, I was I think they were worried about the suits becoming too much two thousand one, and they you, had just mm -hmm. yeah sorry where you where you had them basically become Hal in a suit. Yeah, <laughs> it was Hal and in a suit that could actually chase after you though. They had also just dealt with this in Smile, too. Sort of. Well, it could have been worse. The suits could have been chasing after them going, Hey, who turned out the lights? Um, <laughs> that, yeah, that, that, that was... Yeah, yeah that was actually these suits something actually I thought of while watching it the first time, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Tim, how about you? What didn't you like? This is a very, very minor nitpick, but I thought there were some inconsistencies in Bill's character this time around. Hmm. Uh, her just uh, every now and then she would like ask one question too many or like uh, show a bit too much like doubt whereas I, I think it would have worked better if like the if Nardo was the one who was always saying alright uh, we can go home now can't we like yeah let, let's get out of here you know like and and Bill would like sort of like be in, be in between the do Nardo and the doctor that way but uh, the balance wasn't quite there, I think. But... Yeah, I okay. can see that. Bill? All right, I'm going to say I think the um, the supporting cast was kind of weak. I didn't really feel like I really cared about any of them, and the I think the one that they kind of built up, I think died in the beginning, or at least their partner, or no, or is it their partner died in the beginning? Yeah, the but, partner. The, that person's yeah. partner apparently died in the beginning. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. I don't know the, the way, especially once they met the doctor and everything. The supporting cast didn't really do anything to make me care about whether or not they were saved. Mm. Um. All right, uh, Thomas. Uh, to be honest, the only thing that I had was basically what Bill just said. So <laughs> I'm gonna have yeah. to pass. <laughs> Well, that's fine, because I'm going to build off Bill's. My main issue with them was that they were not rattled enough for the situation they were Oh, yeah, too calm. Mm -hmm. I mean, Except for the being... one that was going to shoot the doctor in the face. <laughs> I mean, that's even weird. here, I mean, I mean, yes, but that's a scene. But you watch them as they're progressing, being chased by these zombies, and they're not really phased anymore. Well, I, suppose. I mean, How you, long get the, you, get the, you get the one... 
that's the you get the one alien that starts snarking snarking at Bill for being racist. Right. And all that, and he doesn't really seem to be shaken. And neither do any of the others. They needed to be more shaken up by what was going on rather than you know, they were just kind of like, What do we do? But there was no there was no feeling of fear. And I don't know if mm. that was the acting or the directing or what happened there. They could have totally rewritten the the blue guy's uh reaction instead of saying, Oh great, we've got a racist, he could have been like, Well, what do you what do you mean you haven't seen anyone like me? I can fight just as well as anyone else and then just kind of be a little bit, you know a little bit of having some shell shock going through him where he's uh, got an itchy well, they could have... finger. Hmm. Well, they could have just clarified that it had been so long that they were just used to this by now. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't was supposed to, to have too. been that long. I mean, it was only supposed to have been a few hours from what I remember. Maybe a mm. day. So that wouldn't have made sense. Well, after a day, you got to learn to either put up or shut up. <laughs> Yeah, a situation um, like that. Well, no, no. Even there, you have you're you're still gonna be shaken. I mean, you're gonna be think a little about... bit shaken, but you you're also at the point where you're uh, going to be moving as quickly as possible to save your own skin. Mm. I'll, also, and be I guess... aware. Oh, sorry. Um, I guess actually, yeah, to even build off that, like the first interaction the Doctor has with any of them is them sort of being yelled at to say who they are, and then when they actually get to them, they're all calm. Yeah, <laughs> they, it's like you see them; they're initially <laughs> shaken, and then it all, and then they just it doesn't happen anymore and mm. no they still need to be they still need to be rattled every time those things burst into a section they need to have fright and panic and it wasn't there yeah mm. like they, they you could try to explain it that they're trying to control their breathing so that they're not breathing so much but still still mm. it's there it, it just it came off as being lackluster all right, so favorite scenes, and Aaron, you're up first. Uh, let me see here. I'll get my favorite scenes. I got a lot of them. <laughs> Actually, what? hmm. I really kind of liked, um, I know it's just at the very, very beginning, but I liked the, the series of cutaways that they did. With Nardole and the Doctor, with our, for, or initially the Doctor's in his lecturing hall, right? And we cut yeah. to Nardole kind of just casually leaning against the wall watching him and Bill. And then you cut cut away to Nardole asking the Doctor, don't you miss it? And uh, there was like a third one, I, I believe, but it was just, I, I felt that, that just that jump was really well done, actually. It kind of really pulled me into um, the situation that the doctor's in, and how desperate he is to that he's just he just wants to get back out there and, and explore, and he can't. Hmm. So. All right, uh, Matt, your best scene. Uh, best scene. Um, the doctor very hush hushedly working on something that ties the suits to the cooling system. And despite being <laughs> blind, all he needs is someone to direct him to the keyboard, and he can do it all. <laughs> Literally, the only thing that was missing from the scene is, hello, computer. <laughs> oh, a keyboard, how quaint. Well, you know, you get your fingers on ASDF, JKL. You know, you, 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 you can pretty much do all massive typing from there. Yeah, he's, l he's, lucky, he he's lucky it was uh, a keyboard from a, a species he was familiar with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Shit. It's an Ice Warrior keyboard. How the fuck am I supposed to do this blind? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Where's uh, the second orb? Oh, well, there it is. <laughs> you negotiate with it. How the fuck do I use the three seashells? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Tim. That uh, scene where the, he asks, Who are you? And he says, I'm the doctor. I'm going to save you. And you're going to wonder about me with the rest of your life. Because I'm a badass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I might have paraphrased that, but that, that was my favorite. I, I, I think there was a little paraphrasing involved there, yes. <laughs> he, did, he did forget to mention his age in there. <laughs> yeah. That is usually something he mentions. And, and, like and his species. That's, that's mm. a tenth doctor thing. I know, but it's actually... Uh, <laughs> It's yeah, there was still, a few episodes ago he did the he did the yeah the he, whole... he he 
yeah. did the whole thing too. Mm. So it's no longer just the tenth Doctor thing. <laughs> the Doctor did a couple times too. Hmm. Okay, uh, Bill. I'm going to go with yes. I really needed someone to state the obvious. <laughs> <laughs> And then Nardol just continues and does not give a fuck what the doctor thinks because he's pissed at him. <laughs> okay. Thomas? Um, I guess out of everything, I'd probably just go with the uh, the bit where Nardol is clearly just in the first like couple of minutes after they get on the space station and Nuttles just like trying to get them to <laughs> leave. Just the, just the way that's done. It was like okay, back to the TARDIS and then like the second time it's just like, okay, let's go back to the TARDIS. It's nice and fun in there. <laughs> it feels like, yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so I've got two. A short one and a long one. Um, want My first one, the short one is right at the very beginning. The first line you hear is Capaldi going, Space, the final frontier. And I'm like, seriously? Are they trying to get Paramount CBS to sue their ass? I, I thought that was weird <laughs> considering that, you know, time would be the final frontier for a time lord. No, that was just them taking the piss out of Star Trek, and I right. got I, I to yeah. give them props for that. But I then it's like idea that... that, that I love the fact that the follow-up was final because it's trying oh. to kill you. <laughs> very, very I had the idea that that was the original way that that uh, intro was written back in the 60s, but someone convinced Gene Roddenberry to change it to, yeah. to now know it. Yeah. I, ironic anecdote, uh, either, I think it was yesterday, I turned on a Bernie Summerfield audio on Spotify and it started off with those same first four words and then went, <laughs> went in a completely different direction. And I'm like, really? <laughs> well, yeah, I think Bit Finish has done that a few times. Because mm -hmm. I think there's a Seventh Doctor one that does that, too. But that one's completely <laughs> taken the piss out of DS9. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, the second longer one is the whole bit with Nardle and the TARDIS and the fluid link. <laughs> oh, wait, did it's they a great... the fluid link, a, a link again? Yes, yeah. only the thing is he tried to convince him that the vital fluid link was the wrong fluid link. No. That's what Nardle had. It's like, here we go. Fluid link K57. No, it's actually fluid link K7 that's the vital one. <laughs> so that's so, that's so, yeah. So he's just like, ha fuck you. Go in anyway. <laughs> I just love that fluid link shout out, though, because we hadn't seen it in a while. Yeah, yeah. it has been quite some time. <laughs> okay, so your least favorite scene. Aaron, you're up first. All right, I'm going to say Bill's death scene. It just did not hit home for me. Um, not even with the references to Bill's mom, which we... There's not really any build-up to Bill's mom other than the fact that the doctor manages to grab some photos of her, which is kind of touching, but at the same time, we never really get to see her. We never get to, you know, learn Bill's mom's story or anything like that. It's very... Yeah, but we don't know. They might they might bring more to that in the future because they keep bringing her back. Yeah, it's, and, it's that, just... and that it seems to it seems to start sounding like a Chekhov's gun to me. Yeah, and mm -hmm. it's you know it might have more importance later, but not knowing anything right now, it just like it's her death was obviously just another red herring it wasn't really a companion mm -hmm. death it was just hey you know oh my gosh you know we're going no, to I kill think, another I, companion i i think that the the big detention there is how is she not dead why is she not dead rather than actually anyone really expecting her to be dead at this point yeah mm. all right um matt your least favorite scene so mine technically builds off of errands I didn't mind the mm -hmm. fact that they were phrasing her off as dead and the doctor said she would still survive it anyways, and I believe the doctor. The problem is is that she gets zapped. She's obviously at least unconscious, and the suit is automating everything. What the hell? How is she unconscious? How does the doctor instantly pull her out of it? And 
just it doesn't make sense. Suddenly, Bill is better again. Yeah, like he Except just pushes she something this... in the suit, and suddenly she's okay and I, awake. I think it inject. I think it, I think it filled her filled her up with her lungs up with oxygen. Either that, or it or it somehow gave her an internal stimulant shot or something. But why would it want to stimulate a corpse? Well, I think the idea is she technically wasn't a corpse. It just knocked her out. Well, yeah, yeah but the suit was ordered to kill her. It didn't have enough mm. power to. But then that, not... that was it. Yeah. But then like, how does he instantly was... wake her up? Mm. Like I said, he do he f he does something on the suit, so I think it administers. They, don't, they a... really don't explain it very well at all, and it just feels mm -hmm. like the hellish. It, they, it's it's Moffat once again not explaining things properly. Mm. That's what it feels like. All right, Tim. I really didn't like the scene where that uh, the the doctor says I'm the doctor, and I liked that scene. But the neat scene afterward, where he gets a gun shoved in his face, could uh, I, I could take a pass on? It seemed kind of awkward. Like it wasn't very genuine. Yeah, it, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it felt like uh, oh, okay. So I, I I get your oxygen deprived and. You're uh, suspicious of this new guy who uh, com comes out of nowhere, but that doesn't mean he's out to get you. You know, it's like you don't have to immediately go to shove a gun in this guy's face. Like, why should we trust you? I, I think they're worried because they think somebody hacked the suits, so they're paranoid mm -hmm. that the doctor and them are the hackers. But yeah, it's not very well written. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's something that she should have done to begin with, I feel. Because, like, that late in the episode, all of a sudden she gets pissed off and starts shoving a gun in the doctor's face. It's, you know, especially when he's blind. You know, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, he maybe he can smell the gun there? I don't know. <laughs> all right, uh, Bill, your least favorite scene? Okay, so I, I may be alone on this one because it's probably kind of nitpicky, but it bothered me both times I watched the episode. So they're on a space wheel, and the whole point of gravity in a space wheel is that the, for, the rotating wheel is pushing you outward, so that's where the artificial gravity would be, is that the outer wall would be down. And so they talk about artificial gravity, and then they immediately show a shot showing that their bodies are perpendicular to that section that would be doing the spinning. So I'm like, so how in the hell is gravity that way when the wheel is that way? I don't even think the wheel's spinning either. Yeah, so. I don't even think the yeah. wheel is spinning. I, I'm, I'm thinking at that point it's Star Trek-style gravity. Maybe it's just circular shape for nostalgia. Then have a space wheel? It's because nostalgia. It's a, space it's a classic. Because wheels are fun. <laughs> the wheels. Well, look at it this way. The company is trying to save money, right? So they don't want to spend <laughs> a lot of... They don't want to spend a lot of money on redesigning a new space station with, you know, the new form of gravity. You just plop the new form of gravity inside the old design. Here's gravity plates, and here's the old school wheel. Goodbye. Yeah. See you later. <laughs> Keep that copper. We ad hoc it. Now to go play with our <laughs> billions and billions of dollars. Until we decide to turn off the oxygen. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> All right, uh, Thomas, your least favorite scene. Um, I'm honestly kind of glad no one brought this up, but it's fairly forgettable anyway, so that'd probably be why. But, uh. Pretty much just the opening bit where the um the woman is like talking to the dude about wanting to have kids. It's like, well, you're dead. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like so the dialogue is like way too like typical oh, and they only had two mo two weeks until retirement kind of dialogue <laughs> and it's just like well, uh, even, even that. The academy. <laughs> they're they're sitting there they're talking about how the, their their suit is telling them how limited their breaths are remaining and she's wasting mm. it doing this bothered talking me talking to herself yeah, yeah. yeah. The with the radio down. not working <laughs> she knows yeah, and the, the dude even gives a crap working. for that yeah, yeah <laughs> it was just kind of 
She's kind uh, of destined to die at that point if she's that dumb. She's failing Darwin <laughs> checks left and right there. <laughs> All right. Well, since Thomas took that one, my least favorite scene, I think, was uh, at one point when Bill is fleeing from uh, space zombies and her suit decides to imitate the Windows assistant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it looks like you're trying to do this. How can I help you? Clippy. Uh, yeah, it's fucking Clippy. <laughs> I never wanted to actually kill a prop before it did that. <laughs> <laughs> but now it must die because Clippy is evil and wrong. <laughs> now they brought in a dog. Looks like you're trying to save the world. Do you want some help? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, that's our, uh, our review on that. Now for our final thoughts. Aaron? I actually really quite liked this. Um, trying to think if I liked it as much as the last one, but I, I really dug the atmosphere. It did feel like you're enclosed in, in, a, in a cramped kind of small space, and um, everything was kind of dark and a bit grim and kind of weird. And I thought the space zombie makeup was pretty good, actually. So I, I enjoyed this one. All right. And Matt? Um, the story and the setting are very interesting and very well done. Uh, the um, the practical, uh, Most of this is actually all practicals, except for a few bit of electricity bits. And that worked really well for them in the long run, I think. Um, uh, most of the acting was very well done, although there are a few little plot holes here and there, but that it happens once in a while. Uh, for the most part, I think it was a pretty solid episode. All right. And Tim? This episode had uh, two flavors that I really love, uh, the cyberpunk and also the it had a gothic horror type feel to it, I think, which uh, uh, it had a sense of, they had a sense of fun about it, also. And uh, there wasn't much to complain about. Uh, uh, seriously. So this was a good episode. Alright. Bill? I feel like this episode didn't really do all that much for me. It wasn't bad, but it just it didn't really grip me emotionally and I feel like I've seen other zombie scenarios that weren't in space that were otherwise you know, similar in threat levels that pulled it off a lot better. Um, I also just kind of felt and I, and I just kind of felt like that the whole you know, evil corporation thing was just a little cliche to the point where, again, not bad but it didn't really do anything for me beyond just feeling kind of middle of the road kind of just standard, I guess. And our negative Nancy award for this season goes to Bill. <laughs> <laughs> well, he is looking at things from a critical point of view. All right, Thomas? Um, I'm honestly not sure exactly where this would like fall for me overall, but I'd say this would, at least as far as the, uh, the episodes we've got so far go, but I'd say... Based on the, I've only really watched it once, so my my views might change after repeated viewings. Um, but the fact that I actually want to watch it again, I mean, it must have done something right. <laughs> All right. So this is, I think, the second episode in a row where I feel that this could have been a lot better episode were it not for the weakness of the supporting cast. Now, last week we did have one particularly good actor, but all the other ones were kind of wishy-washy. Here, other mm. than the Doctor, Bill, and Nardle, none of the cast put in a memorable performance. The writing was very good at setting the atmosphere, but not as good as telling the story. Um, and But the lighting, special effects set design, etc. were all top notch. All mm. in all, it's above average, but I don't know if it's going to be putting in my all-time great list. Yeah. Alright, Aaron, your rating. Uh, I've been bouncing between 4.0 and 4.5. I think um, 
I think I gave the last one knock knock. I think I gave that a five point oh. Correct. Okay. I think can I retroactively lower that to four point five, and I'm going to have this at a four point oh. All right, hang on. I have to change my numbering to retroactive score for that. Woohoo! That's going to change its rating, but okay. I messed things up. All right. So what is this one going to be? This one is going to be 4.0. So not as good as last week's, but all right. Yeah. All right, Matt. Um, I think I'm also at 4.0 with this one. Okay. It was good, but not, definitely not great. Tim? Oh, it was great. You guys are nuts. This is five. <laughs> 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 There's our positive Tim. Yeah. <laughs> Bill? I'm thinking of 3.0. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I came into this. If I could I don't get if you I guys have put all. money down, I could have put down Tim for a 5 and Bill for a 3, and I could have been cashing in the, in the bank right now. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Thomas? Uh, um, I guess just going by previous stuff, and I guess the consequences last episode compared to now, I considering what I gave knock knock, I'm gonna give this oh, I'm gonna give it a four point five. Point five from Thomas. And I personally am going to give this a four point oh uh because I feel like uh it just wasn't quite as good as the uh the last one to me. And that will take it to a 4.1. And that will put this one... Uh, still fairly well. Da, 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 da. You know, you could do a drum roll. <laughs> We'd have to have like a minute and a half drum roll. And this puts it at number 70, 79 on our uh, list of now 201 things reviewed. Hmm. Ooh, it is just above it is just above Castor Valva and just below the pilot. And Knock Knock got knocked down to number 95 with Aaron's uh Reclassification. No. <laughs> so there you have that. You, At you, number... you completely swept that under the rug now. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there you go. At number four. At uh, number seventy-nine. Oxygen. Uh, would you care to take All us right. out, Bill? Yep. All right, so if uh, you enjoyed listening to us, please go ahead and uh, like the video, uh, you know, so we can uh, know how you feel, and uh, go ahead and subscribe to us on Twitch and YouTube so you can get our uh, new streams and up uploads as soon as they arrive. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter for news and updates, and you can head on over to patreon.com slash unearthlypodcast if you want to help support us. All right, so next week... The Vatican has a trouble in one of its libraries, and it's up to the doctor to figure out how to solve it. Plus, we get to finally find out what's in the vault. In Extremis, written by Stephen Moffat and starring Peter Capaldi as the doctor, Pearl Mackey as Bill Potts, and Matt Lucas as Nardle. See you next week. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Bye.